Um, so my advice to, um, to all of you would be to maybe do a little bit more planning um, than I thought of at the time. So um, I, I was a double um, alum. I graduated with my undergraduate degree and the job market wasn't very good um, at the time. And so I was offered the opportunity to be a graduate assistant at the academic advisor's office for the student athletes at the time. So I took the opportunity to stay and it was the best decision that I could have ever made. Um, so you'll have people who will tell you, um, go this way or go that way. Um, you know, take a gap before you get your master's degree or don't. And what I would say to you is just follow your own path, follow your own tuition, uh, make sure you have a plan for yourself. But if you don't have a clear um, line of sight to who you are and what you want to be when you grow up, then um, if you can leverage a graduate fellowship or if you can go part time while you have a job, it might just be the best thing to do. Um, I did find that my master's degree um, has served me well um, in my entire career. It really uh, gave me the foundation of how to really think much more strategically. Um, and it gave me, I want to say, you know, a, a real professional advantage that I didn't know that I had. And, um, and it was during my master's degree that I was able to really focus. I had been general business management. Um, as I've told Mary in the past, I knew what I didn't want to do. So I knew I didn't want to be a micro. I didn't want to be economist. I didn't want to be an actuary. I didn't want to be an accountant. I knew the things I didn't want to be, but I didn't know what I actually wanted to be. Um, while I was in my master's degree, um, I really hit it off and really enjoyed my classes with Dan and Rose Toomey. And um, because of them and their influence in my classes um, and on my thinking, I decided to pursue a career in human resources. And again, um, that was the best decision that I could have made. It absolutely is where I find my joy and I, have, um, I feel like I have a good purpose there as well. So I would say do the things that um, you find joy in and that you find purpose. And also um, another lesson to my younger self, I would say is when other people recognize something in you that you maybe don't recognize yourself, but um, they are people that you value and trust and respect, um, really consider um, really truly listening to them and perhaps following um, some of their suggestions because they probably see you from a different light than, than you see yourself. And they might be able to be more objective in some ways than you perhaps can be. Um, so there's that. So while I was at graduate school, I had the opportunity. I had um, three internships while I was at Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, so it was wonderful during my master's degree. I interned at AT&T, um, which was a paid internship. I interned at ADP, which was a... Um, was a free internship. So I worked for them for job experience, but I didn't get paid. And I also worked for Allied Signal, um, which was another voluntary internship I didn't get paid. Um, but I learned incredible um, amounts of information about how to work with people, what the business environment was like. I got to work on projects in teams, meet deadlines. Um, and I also got to see different industries and I was able to build my resume. So I was able to have work experience that really gave me an advantage. So um, paid internships are great, but sometimes if you can find work experience either through volunteering um, or a co-op program or even unpaid, I know a lot of marketing internships are unpaid, um, I would really consider it because that you're getting paid in a different way. You're getting paid in experience and in exposure. Um, I also had the opportunity um, to work on a project and intern um, at Chubb and Son. And because of my experience with Chubb and Son, um, I was offered a position with them after I um, graduated from my graduate school. So a lot of times those internships do um, give companies the opportunity to try before they buy. Um, so anytime you have an internship, make sure that you're always making the very best impression because that might be a great reference for you if they don't have a job for you, but it also could be your first um, job afterwards. And really your GPA does matter while you're in college. It matters for your first job, um, but it doesn't matter for any job after that. Nobody ever cares after your first job. So make sure you're focusing on your GPA, especially your major in your GPA, and make those connections with your professors too, because many times your professors also um, are connected in the business community and they can also give you great recommendations or referrals or might even be 
in some cases willing to send your resume along also for you. Um, so that was my early career, my, my transformative career. From there, I, I left um, Chubb after a few years because because there was a guy. Um, there's always a guy or a gal, right? Um, and I was in love with this guy who I also met at Fairley, who's my husband now. Um, so he went there also for undergrad. Um, and we met and then we fell in love um, and decided I wasn't ready to leave and move out of state. So I'd say as you think about your career and your career strategies, know yourself know if you're willing to move or not move, have those discussions with your partner, with your significant others, and make the decisions about, um, is it right to move now? Is it right to move at some other time? What decisions are you making at what time in your career? Um, and, and from there, you'll make the right decisions together. Um, and it's okay to say no sometimes. You don't always have to say yes to every job and every opportunity. You do get those opportunities from time to time if you're offered an opportunity to move or you can say no. But um, I did find that being open to career moves and career development um, really enabled me to move ahead in my career probably faster than others. So I would say again, be very open. Um, and the other thing I would say that I learned through my 20 plus years at Verizon was um, don't, don't have your sights fixed on like that job title or that level or that promotion because um, everybody's path is different and yours will be too. And the job that you're going to be in 10 years from now probably doesn't even exist today. Um, and the people and the plot processes and platforms, technology, it'll all be different. Um, so get ready. Um, I know you're students now today, which is why you're here, but you will be students for the rest of your life. We will be all of us committed to lifelong learning. And so your ability to think, your ability to try new things, learning agility, that is going to be one of your most competitive assets. Um, and you learn that and, and you learn some of that in college as you're um, taking, and that's one of the things that Fairley is very good about is teaching you not just one part of business, um, accounting or finance, but also ensuring that you have a broad global view and perspective so that you can think globally, you think more about the world's economy and you're open to innovation and continuous learning. So I would say, you know, always commit to that and think about what can you do to continue to challenge yourself and to continue to learn and grow um, and go from there. Um, every position I was um, provided the opportunity to rotate to um, or be promoted to at Verizon during my time there, um, I only ever applied for the first job at Verizon. So there was always the opportunity to do a good job and be recognized. And so I would say to you too, um, always make sure that you're doing the work um, to perform, but demonstrate your potential because there is this access of, are you a high performer, but you have low potential or are you somebody who has high performance and high potential? And that's, that's really the sweet spot that you wanna be in. So how do you continue to do that? Um, and so be open to lateral opportunities in your career and they will most likely give you the opportunity to go broader and learn a lot about a lot of different things and there will be times also in your career when you will go deeper. Um, and so I think if you do those things, you will build a high, high quality network for yourself. Um, and again, it's a really small world out there. Um, as I mentioned to Mary, I, I left um, Verizon after 23 years, I retired, um, really to take the opportunity to take all of those building blocks that I had had the opportunity and the privilege um, to experience during my 23 years there, but I just wanted to try to, to run it all. I wanted to be able to take recruiting and training and employee relations and compensation and um, org design and development and effectiveness. I wanted to take all those things and be responsible for putting all those puzzle pieces together into a beautiful mosaic rather than just having a piece of it. Um, so I, I, took, I took that scary leap and I, I left at the time but it was the best decision that I could have made for myself because it allowed me to build on everything that I had come before, but I, I had gone back to something that had really served me well in my career. And this is something that as you're developing your career strategies, I encourage you to think about too. And they're just some really simple questions. Um, if you think about who am I? So the first question is, who am I? Um, the second question is, where am I going? And the third question is, 
how can I get there? The fourth question is, who can I help? And then the fifth question is, who can help me? So if you think about yourself you, and really do it honestly, if you sit down very introspectively and you answer those five questions, um, it really takes some soul searching to go through. But who can I help and who can help me? And that's what people who have tremendous networks are incredible at doing. They do things for people just because it's the good thing to do and the right thing to do. They don't do it because they're expecting something back. But when you need something back, somebody's willing to do something for you because you've always been there. And that's also a part of servant leadership, which is so much of who we are today and who we need to continue to be as a, as a global business and as a global world and global citizens. So I would encourage you to ask those questions and then think about your board of advisors or your circle of support. So if you think about that, we all have people in our lives that have been pivotal in shaping who we are and the decisions that we've made to the point in our lives and careers that we're at today, whether it was a teacher you had or a coach that you had, an advisor that you had, um, perhaps it was your priest um, who was you know, a particular voice. It might've even been an older sister, a sibling, or it could have been your, one of your parents. But think about it, all of those people along the way um, become part of your circle of support or your advisors. And it's great to have a really diverse circle of support. So it's great to have people who know all of you. If you only have um, a one-sided circle of support, well, then I guess it's not really a circle. But if you think about it, you want people who know all of you because people who only know you from your family, they're going to see the side of you that they see at home. If you see people who see you in the community, they're going to see that side of you. And the people at work, they're going to see a different side of you. And if you're a leader of people, if you if you manage a lead or lead a team, the people who work for you will see a unique perspective of you, which will be different than the people who are your peers, and will be different yet than the people who are your immediate supervisor or your you know senior leaders. So it's really good to think about all of those different stakeholders, and think about building really really strong and trusting relationships, because the better and stronger your network is the more reliable it will be, and the more truth that you will hear from them. And as you're as you're thinking about furthering your, yourself and your career, um, personally and professionally, it's really always important to think about your personal brand. And many of you probably heard that your brand is really what people say about you when you're not in the room. And if you, if you think about all the people around you and you think, gee, I wonder what they would say about me if I wasn't here. And, and so I would encourage you think about that. And then maybe ask a few people, what is my brand? What is my legacy? What, what is about me that matters the most? What do you think about me and the impact that I make on the team, on the project, um, et cetera? It's that self-awareness that's really so incredibly important because who you are and how you show up is really vital and nowadays more than ever people do reference checks and all of us have digital footprints so there's uh, there's not too much that people can't find out nowadays i mean they might have to pay you know a couple hundred dollars to get access to some some website but today you could find out um how old somebody is almost what their net worth is how much they paid for their house where they went to school um, how many people are in their, you know, in their family, if they've had any arrest records, so on and so forth. You could literally find out just about anything. So managing your brand, managing your digital footprint, um, making sure that you have the right persona um, is really critically important. So there's most people, um, younger people today, um, will be on many, many, many different platforms. And then, so if you think about different age groups and demographics, some people are on Facebook, some people would never go on Facebook. Some are on Snapchat, some men don't even know what Snapchat is. Um, many people are on LinkedIn, which is the most recognized business or professional network or social media that you could use. Um, and that really um, should be where you manage your professional brand. Uh, that is where you have a 
um, a professional headshot, just like you're looking and seeing there of Mary. Um, it should be neat, it should be clean, it should be professional, it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be with a plant coming out of your head or with one of your pets or your children nearby. It should really be an image of the best professional you so that if you showed up in somebody's you know, office for an interview or on a Zoom interview these days, that who they see on LinkedIn is the authentic you, it looks like you, um, and it also is you, and it's a professional reflection so that if they were to hire you, they could imagine that you would be a good reflection of their brand. So that is a first impression. And so what people post on LinkedIn says a lot about them, what you like on LinkedIn, what you post, what you comment on, all of those things, what you read, the interests that you have, the people in your network, the companies you follow, the individuals that you follow, all of those are things that recruiters can see and that hiring managers can see too. So some career advice is, if you manage nothing else, make sure that you manage your professional brand on LinkedIn. References are great. You can ask people to recommend you, um, which is excellent. And there's ways that you can optimize your LinkedIn profile. Uh, there's lots of really good learning that they provide for free on LinkedIn. So you should all take advantage of that as you're thinking about potentially interviewing or managing your career as well. Um, recruiters should not be looking you up on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, but some may. Um, so they may see things that they don't like. Um, and so if you comment on things that are really inappropriate, or if you post things that are really inappropriate, um, they will use that as selection information and criteria and potentially not call you in for an interview or not call you back um, because that information is in the public domain. And if it's something that they could see is in violation of the code of conduct or their values, or in conflict with it, um, they might decide to move on to the next best qualified candidate. So again, what you post on any social media site is, is really important that you manage that and that you keep things you know, as confident as you can, um, and, and especially in terms of um, my personal advice is political views. It's kind of, um, you know, best kept at home, I think, these days. Um, the, the country is so, in many cases, still divided. And, um, and to be part of, of a healing conversation, a unifying conversation is great, but to be, um, you know, sort of in a divisive way right now, I think obviously will you know, be potentially an area of concern. So in generally, I encourage people to really manage your professional footprint and just be careful to um, make sure that what you say is reflective of um, what's appropriate around. Um, so, so that's a little bit what I would say in terms of generic career advice, um, not knowing all of you individually and your own individual backgrounds and um, what's your, what stage of your careers that you're interested in. All of that advice um, really applies all the way throughout. Um, the last thing that I would say is in any part of your life, but especially in your career, make sure you have those trusted advisors who are your truth tellers, people who know you and who you can talk with very objectively and you will listen to them, even when they tell you things that you don't want to hear. It's really, really important. And the best professionals, especially in HR, are the people who build those trusted advisory relationships where they will tell you the truth. They will tell it to you in a very respectful way. Um, they won't tell you everything that you want to hear because that's actually not what you need to hear. Um, so you really want to surround yourself within your board of advisors or your circle of support with people who can tell you the truth, will tell you the truth, and who will give you constructive debate on topics so that you can come to the best, most informed decision. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say before I'll throw it back out and to see if there's any questions or comments or anything you're more, um, more broadly interested in or specifically interested in is just always um, focus on the values that you have and hold. Um, integrity, trust, and respect. There's nothing more important than that in whatever job you have or whatever career. 
And so follow your own heart, um, trust yourself, but always make sure that you are holding yourself, but also the others around you um, to those highest of standards. And it's something that you will never regret. And, and you're, I'm, you're already on this great road. Um, and I know that you're probably thinking, I don't need to be told that, um, but it's always just a good reminder. So I'll go ahead and pause there and send it back over to Mary or Jeremy and see if there's any questions or anything you have for me. Yes, um, Pamela, who's in my class, has a question. Pam wants to know, how did you set yourself apart from others during your career? Oh, great question. Um, so I've always believed it was really two things. One, which was, um, and it was advice that Susan Hoffman gave me from Allied Signal, it was do a good job, keep your head down, do a good job and make your boss look good. And so I've always lived by that work ethic where um, you know, I might not have been the smartest person, but I was always the person who wasn't going to be outworked. Um, I have four children, a husband, two dogs, fish, um, and you can find a way to manage it all. And I think that it's the people who find a way and who will take the messy jobs um, are, and who are fixers are the people that, um, and who are bridge builders are the people who will differentiate themselves. Um, from others. But it's a great question because you do have to differentiate yourself. There are very bright and very talented people all around you. So it gets back to what's your brand? What are you going to be known for? And so having that self-awareness to knowing what you're amazing at and knowing what you're not amazing at, and then identifying what is critical to be successful in the job that you're in and in the job that you want, and then going about either building the network that you need or learning whatever competencies or capabilities are required for success. That's great. We have more questions. JT, who's also in my class, would like to know, when looking at resumes, what qualities do you look for in an intern or someone applying for a full-time role? Hmm. So great question. Um, so First, I would tell most people, most companies today are doing the volume of their recruiting for their um, known internships in the fall. So you really should be right in every career fair, every career event in September, September, October, November. Um, Verizon always had all of our offers out by November. If we were in the spring, it was because we had some people who dropped out of the process or something was new but the majority of all of our jobs are always filled in the fall. So I tell people, you know, when, when, when parents reach out with resumes in March or April, it's almost like, are you kidding me? What, what internships do you think are open now? You, you really miss the window. So I would say, you know, start early, number one. Um, number two is I believe we all look for well-rounded people. So your GPA is a starting point for sure. So if you are below, um, an, if you're below an acceptable rate, certain companies won't look at you. So, and if you have hundreds of people applying for a job, the, the first way that you can do an objective cut is to, to start with GPA. Um, so that's the first place. So differentiate yourself by having a strong GPA. Um, previous work experience, it's always good to have work experience. It's always good to have um, diversity in what you do and what your interests are. Uh, so that's important as well. Um, this is going to sound, you know, obvious, but a neat, clean, professional resume that is well organized, it's articulate, there's no typos. Those all really, if you have a typo, many typos, it goes to show that you. Um, don't have good grammatical skills, you don't have attention to detail, it wasn't important enough for you to proofread it. So I know that sounds really silly, but you'd be amazed how many people have typos and really poor resumes. Um, also, if you have only had a sort of a summer job, if you've only been a lifeguard, but you want to be an accountant, or if you've only been um, a camp, if you've only been uh, the person at Great Adventure who is, you know, collecting cash at the front door, um, and you want to have an office job, 
then it would be best served to try to find a job that can give you office type skills. So even if you volunteer or if you have a job on a at campus, whether it's in a sorority or fraternity, or if it's in a service fraternity, or if it's in a club, um, your book club, and you're, you're the you're an officer, you can demonstrate that you had you know you had to have organization skills, you had time management skills, you had to have influencing skills. So the the, the school the school work is obvious by your GPA and your classes you've taken. What they're actually looking for is your soft skills. What are your leadership skills? What's your ability to critical think? What's your ability to influence? What's your ability to collaborate? Those are all the examples that are gonna differentiate you from, from somebody else in the, by screening your resume and then following up in the interviewing process. That's great, thank you, Claudia. Um, Tiana has a question. Out of all of your internships, which one was your favorite and why? Oh, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, so it wasn't AT&T, um, not because they're a competitor, but I mean, AT&T was great because they actually paid us. They paid us like $10 an hour, which was a big deal back then. And it was a paid internship. Um, so that was, that was great because I actually was paid. And when you're a college student, money's great. Um, but we were doing screening, resume screening. So it actually was good experience to see, but it was high volume. So it was asking the same questions and screening and calling people over and over. So I learned that I didn't really enjoy things that were very rote and repetitive. Um, so that was good learning. The, the internship that I really enjoyed the most was at ADP. And I worked for a gentleman whose name was Dutch Earl. And he was just a wonderful human being. And who would think automatic, you know, automate data processing, payroll, and then they had they had car dealerships. They have such a broad range of who they are and what they did. But he just gave me a diversity of projects. So anything that sort of nobody on his team had the ability to get to, he'd say, okay, give me a proposal of this. Um, let me look at this, analyze that. And so it was the diversity of the jobs, but also the, the person I got to work with and for, and that he trusted me to try new things um, and was always willing to explain the why behind the what. So that was really important for me. And I felt like I learned and grew the most through that. My internship with um, Allied, I really enjoyed um, Susan Hoffman. It was great to work for you know, a female executive and she was just so impressive and, and just her aura was awe-inspiring. So that was really interesting and great to see. But I was working, believe it or not, they were um, at that time, the state was trying to basically incent companies. There, there was this thing called HOV lanes and every lane, like every highway had these lanes with these you know, diamonds on them. And during certain times of day, you weren't going to be able to you know, drive in those lanes unless you had two or four people in the car. And New Jersey was implementing this law and so it was all this research around the air and the environment and tax credits and things like that. So the work, I mean, I did the work, I completed the project. Um, the state ended up rolling back that, um, that rule and the law and the tax you know, implications. So it ended up going nowhere. But again, I, that was work that I, I didn't enjoy that piece of it. So again, that was interesting for me. So um, I think it's great to, if you can, while you're, in college, it, I mean, while you're still exploring, try to have a diversity. And you can ask your professors, especially in your major, if they know anybody that, that needs somebody for a project or they're looking to have somebody to help out. Um, if you could get a diversity of things, because again, I didn't know what who I wanted to be when I grew up. And I learned what I didn't like in all these internships. Um, so I was able to exclude things, which eventually kind of led me down my path, which was more around being an HR business partner, the employee relations, the OD, the advisory, um, human to human interaction, understanding people more than dealing with processes and paper. And that's why I never had a rotation through benefits, for example, that wasn't where I found my joy. That's great. And I think internships are important because they can rule out something that you don't wanna do just as well as confirm what you wanna do. But Joe has a question. He wants to know how important is GPA? So, well, it's really important for your first job. Like it, it is. So I would say now, 
at the bigger companies, you know, at the bigger companies, it's important. So Verizon generally wouldn't look at anybody with less than a 3.0. For certain, for certain majors, it was a 3.5. And that was because they had so many people applying and they had to start with, you know, the screening process somewhere. So generally you want to have a 3.0 because when you're in college, if you're in college full time, your job is to be a student. Your job is to, that's your only, mostly your, your major focus of what you're supposed to be doing. And so, you know, employers are looking at you and saying, if you can't get, you know, straight B's, then how hard will you apply yourself at my company? And if, you know, so were you busy partying? Are you done partying? Were you not paying attention to class? Were you just somebody who just showed up and who didn't do the work? Because nobody wants somebody who's just going to show up. Everybody wants the best of the best. And so everybody wants people who, who can, you know, get a 3.0 or better generally because nobody expects everybody to get a 4.0. Um, in fact, most, most people don't expect anybody to get really a 4.0 and be a really well-rounded person in college. So if you, if you struggled and your GPA is less than a 3.0, then you, I would say like, know what your story is. Why is your story that you struggled with GPA? Is it that you were going to school at night because you had to have a full-time job? Is it that you struggled, you started out in a certain major and then you switched, but the first year or two, you know, put you back. And so, but your GPA and your major now is a 3.7. So there are ways that you can tell the story. It has to be, you know, authentic and real, but you can, you can get around it. Smaller companies tend to care less about the GPA than, than, the, than the bigger ones, but it's also probably because they're going to get more referrals from people that they know, from um, people from other businesses. They're probably also not getting the same gigantic pool of applicants that a Google or Facebook or Verizon or, you know, Morgan Stanley are getting. That's great. Thank you, Claudia. Joe also wants to know, does it matter on industry, your GPA? So for example, if you're an accounting major, maybe the accounting firms expect a higher GPA. I mean, you sort of answered that based on big companies versus small companies, but do you think it matters based on your major and in industry? So it, it does. Um, it, I, I think the, um, the, the upper out culture, so it does because if you're going to be graduating and uh, attempting to get a internship at KPFG, Deloitte, ENY, McKinsey, Bain, any of the big four accounting firms or the big consulting firms, it is so competitive to get into their companies and they want the best and they're going to pay the best. So they're paying very, very high rates of pay, um, $20, $30 more than somebody with a generic business degree or communications degree or major. And so because they're paying premiums, they care more about your work ethic and your dedication and your technical knowledge. Um, so it can absolutely matter um, in certain industries. And some of these industries and majors, they are more technical focused and they are less referral focused um, because they, again, wanna make sure that they have the best of the best. And so they're gonna have very objective screens. Now, do people slide through? Sure, people slide through. They get a professor that writes an amazing letter. They have somebody at, the, at that company who's an alumni. They have somebody at that company who knows somebody on the board of directors. So I would say if you know somebody on the board of directors and you wanna get in the company, sure, ask, your, you know, ask them to forward your resume to somebody in recruiting. Um, it absolutely happens. It happens all the time. Um, but the networks that you have, that your family has, that they need to be good and strong ones, there's lots of ways that you can get your resume into a company. It can be through campus recruiting. It could be through LinkedIn. It could be through applying for a job on the internet or LinkedIn. It could be through a friend or a relative or a friend of a relative who's willing to send your resume directly into somebody that they know um, in addition to you applying on, on your own. That's great advice, Claudia. Thank you so much. I agree with everything you said 100%. We're getting some more questions. This is terrific. Noah has a question. For international students, there are a few factors that make getting internships a bit more difficult. 
realistically, what are the prospects? And do you have any particular recommendations on how to best position ourselves to gain opportunities? International students. Yep. So um, there, so during the prior administration, it was very, 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 very difficult um, to get visas um, for whether you were an au pair who was looking for um, a year assignment in the United States, or if you were a student, an engineering student who is here um, from whatever country is your home country. Um, it was very, very difficult um, as an employer to be able to get visas for um, individuals in this situation. And so I believe the situation will turn around and it will become a little bit easier going forward with the new administration. That's what we're hearing anyway so far. Um, it's harder because there, there are obviously you have to be able to get sponsorship for those um, for those jobs. Not all companies do it. Not all companies will hire um, international students. They're not sure they're going to convert. Um, it can be expensive. Um, there's extra um, administrative work that's required in the process. So again, I think using a network is the very best thing that you can do. Um, leverage your professors, leverage the um, college advisors. You may have to be more active on LinkedIn um, than others. You might have to join. Um, there are tons of groups on LinkedIn. If you just Google, you'll be able to find a group. You'll be able to get advice. And so I would do that. I would go find groups of people, find advice from others, what companies um, hire people. So when you go, if you apply, you will find where it'll say, do you require a visa? And if you do, it will then in some cases say, I'm sorry, this position only um, is for people who currently are legally able to work in the United States. And if, if you don't have that visa, then you can't answer that question that you can. So um, companies that are large, that are global, multinational, they tend to um, hire more people who are from different countries. And so I would, I would encourage you to start with bigger companies, number one, because most smaller companies don't even know what they would have to do to be able to onboard somebody from, from another country who would require a special visa but all of the very big companies do, um, who have global footprints, all of those companies um, have at some point in time or will again um, be open to hiring people um, who, who require sponsorship. You might um, be able to get an internship, but not in the United States. It might require you to get an internship, but maybe in another country. So that's something to think about too. Um, the final thing I will say is right now, it's incredibly challenging with COVID. And so this is a really rough year and rough time. Last year, the way that COVID happened, um, almost like all the big companies had their offers out already. Everybody had their offers for internships or for full-time jobs. And the, thankfully, not going when most companies honored those internship offers and they, most companies shifted the start date back or they went to fully virtual internships and they honored those. And, Many companies gave people full-time job offers as a result of that. Um, I, I believe that you know this year, because there were so many unknowns in the fall with COVID, um, there were fewer internships that were even available because many companies, many industries tightening their belts um, because there are a lot of revenue loss. I mean, unless you were Amazon um, or Target or Walmart or grocery stores, um, so many businesses were off on their revenue. They, they lost like a whole quarter of revenue and it takes time to dig out of that hole and to reimagine your business model. So um, I'd say be patient and give it time. Um, those internships might not be here for this summer, for this year. And so you might have to think about, you know, what are your other alternatives and options until things turn around much more positively. And most likely probably that would be more like next fall. Thanks, Claudia. Um, Stevan has a question. This is a really, really good question. How can someone stand out or participating in Zoom or team interviews? Because that's a whole different, you know, mindset and something that we're not used to. So if you can give some advice on how they can stand out and just, you know, tips on, you know, making a good impression on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. So, um, so there's different types of Zoom interviews. So there are, um, there are video interviews, which you're just 
zooming into a computer. So that so there's AI generated videos that happen today. So a lot of companies are cutting their recruiting costs by eliminating humans in the process. So you'll go on, you'll have the screen, you'll get your questions, and you will just speak your answers into into the into the video. Um, and then the next question will come up, and then you'll just speak your answer. And you'll have an opportunity to delete it and then say it again. So um, the the bots are um, trained by humans to look for certain things. They're look they're looking for um, in some cases they're looking for specific words. They're looking for combinations of words. Um, they're in some cases they're looking for confidence. Um, in some cases they're looking for diction. So if you're going to be on the phone with a lot of people, they're going to be looking for you know how well do you articulate and things like that. So there's the, you know, the computer generated where it's just you speaking to a video. What I tell people is there's nothing like practice. Practice does make perfect. And so if you know that you're going to have a video interview and you're just interviewing with a bot, then um, think about whatever questions you might get asked. Um, you prepare, know your resume, and you need to know your background. So you need to know you, but you also need to know about the job because they're gonna ask you, why are you good for that job? And why are you better than somebody else for that job? And so you wanna be able to speak with confidence and you wanna be able to speak with quality about that job. Now, if you are actually in a human interview, so you've made it past the screening interview and you're interviewing with a person or with a panel, um, there's a few things that I tell people. Always, always, always test the technology first. Test the light, test the audio, test the video. Um, no kidding, go buy that circle thing, that circle glow thing that you could put behind you on the tripod so you get the backlighting. So you're not like, you're just not in the shade the entire time. So make sure your lighting works. Some people have it on GoToMeeting, some people have it on Teams, some people have it on WebEx. Um, there are, some people have it on Zoom. Every technology works different on everybody's computer and there's different versions of GoTo and Zoom and Team. So you don't wanna show up late. You don't wanna show up and your audio doesn't work or your video doesn't work. So make sure that you've tested it in advance. It is okay to say, you know, would it be possible I haven't used this technology? Is it possible that I could test this with the recruiter in advance to confirm that it works? Um, most recruiters want you to get a job because as soon as they fill that job, they can move on to something else and they fill their job and they get a check. So don't be afraid to ask um, to, to try the technology before. And then, um, then the other piece is, is make sure that you're looking at the video. So make sure that you're not looking down at the keyboard or down at looking at notes. Make sure that you're looking at the video make sure that you are smiling. One of the most important things about video interviewing is being human and being approachable. They want to feel like they can work with you. Eventually people will come back into the office and they want to feel like when you come into the office that you're gonna be a good team member and they're gonna wanna know that you're not you know, plastic or starch. They're gonna wanna get a feel for who you are um, on the video. And also practice. I tell people like get in, I know it sounds silly, get in front of the mirror and practice. Like look at the mirror, listen to yourself talk, um, check out your outfit, make sure your outfit doesn't look like a, a mess, make sure that your camera is good. It's just like as if you were going to an interview, but you no longer have to have the handshake anymore. Great advice. And I have to admit, I actually did buy a ring light and it does make a difference. It does. And I know students have bought um, green screens and um, they're on Amazon for like $30 and that makes a difference as well. So um, very, very important. So we have some more really great questions. Um, Ihani from my class wants to know, how do you manage work-life balance and dealing with mental fatigue or exhaustion that may come from work? Now you have four kids. So You've had an, you still have an incredible career. So please give us some advice. So, you know, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg who said like, make sure your partner is a real partner. 
Um, I've been blessed to have a real partner in my life, my husband, Chance. And so like we co-parent, like we really full out co-parent. Um, and so we, we, we take turns and we decided we were not outsourcing our children. So we made those decisions that were right for us at different points in our careers. Um, I've also lived by um, a, you know, don't get an A at work and an F at home or an A at home and an F at work. You need to strive for mostly getting A's in both places, um, which means from time to time you could get a B or a C, um, but you should never get a D or an F just like in real life. And so for me, what's really, really worked is, and my, my husband would say I'm a workaholic and he would say I never let it go. So sometimes I ignore him, but, um, but what I would say is like, fill your life with joy and just know who you are and you're going to make choices. And so I work oftentimes seven to seven. Um, like I'm here realistically, I'm, I'm six months doing my job. I'm at the office by 6.15, 6.30. Most days I leave here at quarter to six and then I'm home by seven. I'm with the kids until about 8.39. And then, um, then I'm getting ready to go to bed because I'm up at 4 a.m. So that's the choice I make now on this job. But what I've always done for me, and this just works for me, Friday night at five o'clock until Monday morning at 7 a.m. Like that's my time. That's my time for me, for my children, for my husband, for my friends. And I, 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 I really guard that time for my family. And so for that time, I'm fully, fully, fully present. Now, if there was a union organizing campaign, I worked. If I had to get on a plane to travel for a quarterly business review on a Sunday to be there, you know, first thing on Monday, I would do that. If I had to leave on Sunday to travel to Asia because I needed to get on their time, then I would do, I would do that. Um, but that was like kind of the exception. But I also, I looked at my calendar and it was kind of calendar management where I would, I would, plot out the most important things in my family's life, um, weddings, funerals you can't plot out, but you have to be there for the funerals too. Um, first day of school, I never missed the first day of school. Graduation, never missed a graduation. Um, school play, never missed a school play. I miss lots of school conferences. I hate school conferences, my husband did them. Um, so he did the school conferences, he was that guy. I did the plays, I did dance. And you just figure out what works, um, but just know that if you want to be an executive someday, it's there's no such thing as a nine to five executive. There's not an eight to five executive, and there's not a seven to five executive. It's like a fifteen hour a day job, um, and sometimes on the weekends. So you just again, it's just choices that you make, um, and just and just know that about yourself. We knew we found the most joy in having children, but we also wanted to have a good life and we wanted to do things. We wanted to travel. That was really important. We wanted to save for retirement. Um, my father had been laid off later in his life. He had been in the army for 21 years. He retired as a major. And after he retired, then he went into, you know, the public sector and here he is, you know, he left army and then he started getting jobs in, you know, different companies, warehousing, you know, warehousing, logistics, manager, director, and those jobs started being offshored and outsourced to Mexico and he wouldn't move. And so his jobs, you know, kind of dried up. And so I learned that there was no such thing as job security. And it was really scary for me because he was the primary income earner in our family. And my mother, um, she worked too for, I think I, when I was like nine or 10, she went back to school and she was a secretary. She was an executive secretary. So for us, my dad ended up working three jobs to be able to sustain the family. And so my husband and I said all along, we were going to both always work. Neither one of us was going to stay home. So he wasn't going to be a stay home dad. I wasn't going to be a stay home dad either. I took all my maternity leave. I took four months for my first child, three months for the next three. Um, they were all in daycare until the last two. I put them, we had them, we had a nanny because by the time you had two a year apart, it was it was like unaffordable to have them both in daycare. It was actually cheaper to have a live-in nanny um, than to have two infants in daycare. Um, and so you just make those choices about what's right for you. And if you have a really good partner and a support network, 
it can it can work. Um, but you just have to build that plan together and then make those choices. That's great advice. And you're proof that you really could have it all. So kudos to you. That's terrific. I say you can have it all. You just can't have it all, all the time. Totally agree. Totally agree. Christy, uh, Chris Lee has a question. When offered multiple internships, how did you decide on which one to pick? Hmm. Well, I never had more than one at a time. Um, they were, they were, these were things that were coming to me through my professors who were all very, um, there used to be, I, I think it's changed now, but there used to be the Center for Human Resources Studies. It was called CHARMS. Um, and so the, the, the professors were all very involved with um, companies and HR executives in the Northern New Jersey area. And so these companies um, contributed to the, the Center for Human Resources Studies and they also really knew the professors and they, um, they really you know, admired them for their knowledge and expertise that they offered. So they would come to, to the Charms um, office and they would say, hey, we're gonna have an internship. Do you have somebody you know, at the MBA level um, that were at, in undergraduate through the College of Business that might be interested? So I really was never in a multiple offer situation until when this job um, that I took this year, I had two or three different companies that I was in the process of interviewing with um, for, for other you know, senior HR roles. Um, and so what it was, was important for me, I made, I'm a list person. So what I did was I made a list. And um, so, you know, there's the, there's the personal and there's the professional. So, you know, how is this going to affect my personal life? Um, how does this affect my family? Like, how does it affect my, fin my extended family? My, my mother's in her seventies and she's not moving. Am I gonna have to move and leave my mother? Um, so if I, have to leave, if I have to leave my mother at this age and she won't move, then it's probably not a good, good decision for me. Um, am I gonna have to relocate my children and start my children in a new school? And that's probably not a good choice for me at this point in time. So I would you know, make a list of how would this affect your how does this affect your marriage? You know, some people take jobs that require them to be away from home five days a week. How is this going to affect my marriage with my husband? Is that is that something that we want at this time in our life? Do I want to be on the road five days a week? So you kind of make the the list of how does this affect the people who are most important to me? I mean, I work to have. I don't I don't live to work. I work to live. And so, how does it affect the people that are most important to me? And then, how does this affect my career? So the choices that I'm going to make if I have options. Is this the right logical next job for me? Am I going to learn? Am I going to grow? Am I going to be challenged? Um, am I, can I see myself there for five or 10 years? Um, do my values align with this company? Do I like the person? Do I respect the person that I immediately need to work for? Because your immediate manager is the most important person because that person like, controls your life. They control your raises, your promotion, um, whether or not they're going to refer you, special projects, special training. So, you know, you kind of say like, do I like this person that I would be working for? And then what's the brand of that company? Are they known as a competitive brand? Do they have a good reputation? Are they growing? Are they shrinking? So you really, I would say, do your research to say, like, does this fit with who I am as a person and my personal life and family values? Does this fit with my professional values? And is this Remember, I asked the question, who am I and where am I going and how can I get there? Um, like, is this next job going to get me where I want to go longer term um, or is it going to be moving me further away? And sometimes I think people make decisions that take them further away. And so you just need to be really intentional um, and talk about it. Talk about it with the people who know you. When I when I was thinking about taking this job, I Spent a lot of time, my, none of my children knew. I didn't tell them any of them about it because I didn't want to disrupt their lives or have them, you know, get excited about one thing or the other. One of the jobs was in Pittsburgh and they were like, oh, dance moms, let's go. It's co so cool. We can join Abby Lee Dance Studio. Um, I'm like, no, that definitely is not happening. So don't talk to the people that you know that you trust who will keep it confidential because you don't want it to get out there while you're deciding. Um, and, and then just make the best decision. The thing with internships, it's one is just for a summer typically. <clears throat> but the other though is, is if, if you have the choice of more than one internship, then think about, you know, 
where could you like, is this company going to be in a position to offer you a full time job or are they just offering you summer internship? What kind of conversion rates do they have? Do they convert 50 or 75 percent of their interns to full time hires? Or do they just have people come in for the summer just to clean things up and then they go on? Because you want to ask those questions. Number one, you're going to look really smart, but you also want, if you have the choice to work for a company that's more likely to offer you a job, <clears throat> because there's nothing like going back to campus in September and you already got a job. You don't have to stress about that. You can, but you already got a job offer with a great company and then you can really get good grades, but you can really enjoy your senior year rather than having to also stress about where you're going to be working. Again, great advice. And the thing you said about a boss, that's so important. The number one reason why people leave their job is because of a boss. So very, very good advice. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, what industry do you see thriving and what programs will help us improve our skills? Hmm. So thriving industries today. Um, so clearly, um, Amazon is doing very well. So direct to consumer companies are doing very well. So COVID really had that impact where um, it really became the impetus to make every brick and mortar company become a digital company. If, if a company wasn't digital before, they sure are digital now. Um, <clears throat> so um, Amazon, any direct to consumer company they're going to be in a better place. They don't have the brick and mortar exposure. They don't have to sell their buildings. Um, they can increase and decrease their um, workforces very, very quickly. Um, so distribution, logistics are all still very great industries to be in. Um, anything where you're um, leveraging your digital skills. So if you look at companies that are continuing to grow. Um, if you look at the financial services companies, um, all doing very well, they're all looking at new financial models um, and they really have a, they will be successful forever. So if you look at the companies that have been around, you're gonna look at Amex, you're gonna look at um, JP Morgan Chase, you're gonna look at those companies They've been around for a long, MasterCard, they've been around for a long time because they continue to disrupt themselves in order to not be disrupted. So they're continuing to figure out how they can stay on the sort of on the leading edge um, and figure out how to continue to get more wallet share. So financial services continues to be a really good and robust industry. Um, obviously healthcare um, has been a robust industry for decades. Um, and also tends to be one of the most employee friendly industries to be a part of um, with all of the emphasis around COVID. Um, there's been an increased focus on health and on well-being. Um, so in that area, so for the next foreseeable future, um, we're going to have masks in our lives for at least the next year. We're going to have hand sanitizer in our lives. We're going to have immunizations um, for an incredible long period of time and other things like that. Um, and you can see now new and different ways that people are meeting those needs that are, are evolving. Um, you know, if you think about now CVS, CVS has become one of the, you know, larger ways to receive a vaccination. So um, thinking about over telemedicine um, has become one of the greatest things. Telemedicine was nothing six, 12 months ago. It was zip, it was like a blip on the radar. So how do you take all of that um, and now go forward? So data security, anybody who is in data security, um, there's, there are not enough people in that industry, in that sector, they can't find people government, government services. Um, so if you're interested in moving down to the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, um, the government services, how do we continue to, um, <clears throat> how do we continue to be secure? How do we secure our data? You see all of these um, <clears throat> Bitcoin rising, you see companies that are held hostage um, for their servers and their file and their data. Um, and they're literally ransomware attacks. That's a real thing. It's a big, big, big thing. 
Um, so people and industries that can help to protect your data, that can get your data reconstructed, those are all areas that are continuing to grow. Um, I'm a big fan of Horizon um, in the technology sector. Um, they will, they have been around forever. They will continue to be around. They're continuing to look at how do you connect everything to another thing? Um, cars are going to be connected to everything. Your phone is going to be connected to everything. Your phone is going to be the passport to your life. Um, my old boss, Ronan Dunn, used to say, they had a saying in the UK, better homeless than phoneless. If you can imagine that. Um, not in, not in a blizzard, you would never say that, but if you think about most people today, if they left the house without their phone, they would go back. If they left the house without their wallet, they would not go back because they could still use their, their phone most likely to order an Uber or Apple Pay. If they left their house without their car keys and they didn't need them for their car, they would not go back to their house. So if you think about it, so those would be some industries and sectors that I think are going to continue to keep growing and, and boom. That's awesome. Great advice. It's true. I would not go back for my car keys. Huh? I would go back for my phone. Very, yeah. very, very good advice. Jennifer has a great question. I was actually going to ask you this question if someone else didn't ask it. If any, what are some things in your career that you regret not having done earlier? So, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not that person. Um, I'm not that person that looks back and regrets. And I guess it's because there's nothing you could do about it, really. Um, and I'm, I'm a glasses half full person, and it's really served me well. I feel like um, we are where we are, and we are where we're meant to be. Um, and so, and so I, I guess if you live your life all the way along, according to your values, and if you make choices knowingly, then, then you should be happy with where you're at. Um, if I, if I really want to push myself and be, be critical, um, I see p other people who got to CHRO sooner, maybe younger, and some maybe not younger, but maybe contemporaries of mine who are maybe in, in bigger companies. And if I had left, um, if I had left Verizon sooner, um, maybe to go and make a bigger career jump earlier, because the, you know, the phone calls, they do come in when you're working at big companies, you, you, you do definitely get recruited. You know, maybe I would have become a CHRO sooner, maybe I would have become a CHRO at a bigger company. But then again, maybe not. So for me, um, you know, I'm very happy, like Verizon was amazing to me. I was some of my best friends. Um, I had all four of my babies when I was at Verizon and like they treated me well. I mean, we've, we've got an amazing life and we're so blessed in so many ways. So I think of it that way. I guess my advice would be live your life without regrets, go all in, live according to your values and, and don't worry over that spilled milk. Um, you know, just focus forward and because there's a reason you took the path that you did. There's a reason you are where you are today. It's where you're meant to be. And if you're, if you're not living your best life right this moment, then give yourself time. It's because there's bigger plans for you yet and you're just not intended to be there yet. So give yourself some grace. Um, don't look back. People spend why would you spend 90% of your time looking out the rear view mirror? That's where you've been. It's not where you're going. So why not spend time, more time looking out the, the front um, of where you want to go and where you want to be and, um, and kind of letting that part of it go. I think that's great advice. And um, I don't believe in regrets either. I don't look back, so I can totally relate to that. And I was going to ask what advice you would give to your 18 year old self, but you just gave that advice. So, uh, so that was terrific. Really great. Um, anybody have any last minute questions? Cause we've already taken so much more of Claudia's time than I promised her, but this has been amazing. And I think, uh, someday you should teach a class at FDU. <laughs> okay. I'm going to come back on. Anybody have any questions or any last minute things they want to ask? Claudia, you are so young to be where you are. So <laughs> I think you did everything 100% right. 
Oh, thank you. Seriously, you're, you're, you're very young. Too. And you've had such a successful career at Verizon and now at Structure Tone. And, you know, amazing. I think the best is, you know, still yet to come for you, you know, which is uh, inspirational. Oh, thank you. I will, I will give one bit of advice. I, I, it's funny, I will say, like, my last parting advice is be you. Just do you and be you. I don't know if you could see behind me. I know it's hard, like on these one-inch tiles, but like this, this, these are my Christmas cards from a couple years, and they've got my children. And like, I spend so much time here. I just want to see my family, and so I have the pictures of my family up. And then one year for Christmas, my daughter, my younger daughter, who says she's my favorite daughter. I don't have any favorites, but she says she is. She made that for me, and she signed. She signed the back, and. I just find so much joy in it. And so, you know, it's funny, somebody said to me, oh, it's like you have like cute little artwork and is it really professional to have that up? You know, you're a CHRO, shouldn't you have a more like proper professional, like I'm like what, starchy office? And I said like, no, like when you get me, like you get all of me and like who I really authentically am. And if you want me to like whitewash who I am, and fit some mold, then that's just not who I am. And so that would be sort of the last bit of advice. Be you, be all of you, be the authentic you, be a good you, but be, but be you, and work with people and for people and for companies that will let you be you and who really want that. And so that diversity um, is so important. And I will tell you, Verizon was one of the most diverse companies in the world and had lots of accolades and recognition for that. Construction is not one of the most diverse industries. So it's really intentional for me to be a woman um, here and to, to really be a woman and to, you know, not be afraid to show that I'm a mother and that I care about my children and that life is messy. So just remember, sometimes life is messy and it doesn't always have to be perfect. And there isn't one mold that everybody could or should fit in. So just be you and do you and do it amazingly well and you will be successful in whatever you do going forward. So Mary, thank you so much for having me. It was absolutely my pleasure. You were terrific. And I recorded this, so I'm happy to send it to you, but you were flawless, inspirational, perfect. Everything I wanted this to be and more. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you for the honor and privilege of speaking with you guys. And again, as Mary said, you're amazing. I really appreciate all the questions. So thank you for that. And, I, and I'm and i gonna sign off now because I'm leaving in about six minutes to, to make the commute home. Yes, so go. thanks everybody. Thanks, Claudia. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.